in the last few months we've been thinking about one of the really main themes of the Bible, what it says about the future, what we call in theological shorthand eschatology, the study of last things. You say, well, isn't this really not a very important part of the Bible? And keep in mind that close to 25% of the Bible, when it was written, was talking about future events. And many of the things that we see said about the Lord Jesus Christ have been already fulfilled in his first coming, but many, many others will be fulfilled at his second coming. And the last stanza of the song that we sang talks about his return visibly to the earth to set up his kingdom, where the crowns of all the kings of anywhere will be upon his head, and he will rule and reign in a kingdom that will never be overthrown. But the Bible also talks about the return of Christ for the church, and I'm convinced more and more as I look at this question that the return of Christ for the church is the first phase of the second coming of Christ, and it is distinct from his return in glory to set up his kingdom. Mm. We've talked about the Bema Seat judgment a number of months ago, where believers will be rewarded for their service for Christ in relationship to what we will have done, not by our own strength, by our own wits, but in dependence upon the Spirit of God to um, cause our efforts to be fruitful for eternity. We've also begun to look at a number of New Testament passages about the return of Christ for the church, and we started with John 14, 1 to 6, where Jesus says, um, I'm going to prepare some dwelling places for you in my Father's house. There are many dwelling places like this. If that were not so, I would have told you about that. And uh, I'm going to come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. So that when that happens, everywhere that the Lord Jesus is, we will be with him as well. Last time we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is a key passage that talks about the uh, coming of Christ to snatch away the church uh, into his presence. Those who have already died, having placed their trust in Christ, will be uh, resurrected from the dead, and those who are still alive when Jesus comes for the church will have their bodies transformed in an instant, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye. This afternoon I would like to go to yet another passage in the Thessalonian literature, in uh, 2 Thessalonians this time, in chapter 2. And the passage that we're going to read is a passage that directly speaks about this event of the rapture or the catching away of the church, and also speaks of it in a way that perhaps is less familiar to us. And I'd like us to think about that. What I'm going to try to defend here is admittedly a minority view when we look at all the literature that is available on this topic, which really doesn't prove whether or not it's true or false, because there are many uh, things that are stated that are uh, um, photocopied and printed that are the major majority view that are contrary to Scripture. So there'll be some things here that may be unfamiliar territory for us, but I want you to think about it and uh, study it for yourself. Let's read our passage, First Thessalonians, sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We beseech you, that is, we urge you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ, the better reading is the day of the Lord, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie or the lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. This is the next text we want to look at in regard to the rapture of the church, the coming of Christ for those since the day of Pentecost until the day of his return for the church. And it is found in a follow-up letter to the church of Thessalonica, which Paul had uh, been used by God to found six months, maybe, or maximum one year before the writing of this letter, roughly 61 AD. 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are part of the earliest letters of the New Testament. First came Galatians. I should say the first letters of Paul. First came Galatians, and then first and second Thessalonians, and then other letters that are familiar to us. Prison epistles, of course, are much later, and the uh, pastoral epistles, first and second Timothy and uh, Titus, are all the way at the end. There are a couple of things I want us to think about in this passage, and the first two I want to move through fairly quickly so that we have time uh, to fit in the third major emphasis. First thing I want you to notice is in verse 1, that Jesus' return is the subject at center stage in this, uh, the middle of this book. The return of Jesus for the church is at center stage. We beseech you, we urge you, brethren, by the parousia, that is the presence, compound word, para and usian, para being around, as in parabole, and usia, which has to do with being or presence. If you're around, you're close, you're, you're present. The presence of Christ, regarding the presence of Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. This is a term that we, is very closely associated with the word synagogue, you know, the, the gathering of Jewish people on Saturday, with a little preposition in front. The, the gathering together unto Christ. He's speaking here about a theme that he had dealt with when he was with the Thessalonians, when he first taught them the gospel. He repeated it in 1 Thessalonians, where in every chapter you see a reference to the return of Christ. And now he comes back to this same theme in regard to the coming of Christ and the gathering of the church to him. Um, here's the second main point. We await the return of Christ in the context of present troubles. Verse 2. Do not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, either by spirit or by word 
or by letter as, a, as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand, the day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is the time when God is going to test unconverted people who are living on the planet to see how they will respond to God's justice and righteous anger over sin when they see it displayed. Now we're living right now in a time when the grace of God is manifested despite the fact that there are often conflicts and wars and uh, natural disasters. That's the way it's been very much through the span of time. But none of these things are a revelation of the wrath of God that will yet one day be displayed. Another passage that we're going to look at, Lord willing, uh, in the next couple of months in Revelation 3, verse 10, it makes it very explicit that the purpose of what is often called the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week or the time of Jacob's trouble, lots of different handles that we can use for this time, the purpose of it will be to test, not to test with the purpose of improvement, but to display the corrupt human heart when people see the judgment of God being doled out. The day of the Lord that Paul is dealing with in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 here is a time of the display of the wrath of God against sin to test if people will repent when they see the wrath of God. And maybe you've noticed this in various situations that you've gone through or that you have observed uh, over your lifespan that when people hit turbulent water, they can respond in one or two ways. Sometimes God uses those turbulent waters to break them and to do them good, and they make corrections in, in the way they live. But there are other people who face exactly the same circumstances, and they become hardened in their rebellion. And in many cases, when the day of the Lord comes, that is what is going to happen. And because the Thessalonian believers knew what the day of the Lord was going to be, because Paul talked a lot about future things in his teaching about the gospel, this was part of his, his whole discipleship package. You read in the book of Acts that he was speaking often about the question of the kingdom of God. What is it? And, and how, does God program, how does God's program fit together with the Jews and the creation of the church? And what is the the storyline of God's work in the world. Because the Thessalonians knew these things, when they went to the mailbox one day and the uh, pastor of that church, if there was one at that point, I suppose one had been named, uh, pulled out the scroll and looked at the letter and he said, oh, here's a new letter from the Apostle Paul. How nice of him to write to us. Oh, no, look what it says. We're already in the day of the Lord. Signed, Paul. The problem was that just like you received fake mail, there were false pieces of information that came to churches that Paul had started even way back in the middle of the first century. And so Paul says in verse 2, do not panic. Do not allow fear to overcome faith because God's wrath is not yet being poured out. Do not be shaken in mind, the word is used in the New Testament for an earthquake. It's used for a boat that is loose from its moorings and uh, gets tossed around in, in, on the seas. It's used uh, for the house that was built on the sand and the wind came and smashed it and it was shaken to its core. Don't be like those things, shaken in mind and do not be disturbed, do not be troubled, don't be alarmed. Don't be all in a panic when you listen to the news. But the reason for their panic was that apparently a, a false letter had been sent to them as if it were from Paul, nor by letter as from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is at hand. That 
you are already in it. How is Paul going to encourage them not to be shaken in their faith when he says the day of the Lord is not started, so don't panic? Well, he says, do not be deceived. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. It's important for us to realize that deception is something that true Christians can be faced with. That's right. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you believe that you cannot be deceived, then you need to read a verse like this. Because before the Thessalonian believers received 2 Thessalonians, it was obvious that some of them were being tempted by a deceiving voice. And we see this in other uh, writings of the New Testament. Uh, the old, for that matter. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Don't let anyone deceive you with empty words, because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Don't be partakers with them. You used to be darkness, now you're light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. Don't be deceived. He warned the Romans in Romans 16, at the very end of his letter to those Roman Christians, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances that are contrary to the teaching which you have learned. Turn away from them, because these men are slaves, not of the Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. And the Apostle John says this in 1 John chapter 2. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. And as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. <coughs> or think of the two men who are mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Hymenaeus and Philetus. Paul says they went astray from the truth and they upset the faith of many by teaching that the resurrection has already taken place. Reminds me of some who go to the book of Revelation today and read in chapter 20 about the, the first uh, resurrection and the second resurrection and claim that the first resurrection is conversion. So if you have trusted Christ, you're already the first resurrection has already taken place. This is another form of this heresy. I think of Acts chapter 20, where Paul addresses the leaders of the church at Ephesus who had come to meet him at Miletus, and he warned them. Even the strongest of the, the Christians in Ephesus, where he had worked for those three years, and said, some of you are going to draw away disciples after yourselves, speaking perverse things, you will deceive your own people to get power. Or I think of Paul speaking to Titus about the churches in Crete. And he says in chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things that they should not teach for the sake of dinero, that's the original Greek for sordid gain. Deception is always the strongest when we would rather believe the lie. It just clicks with us when the false message scratches our ears. And that is why Paul says, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, to Timothy, watch out, because uh, there are teachers who will emerge, who will tickle the ears of their hearers by proposing doctrines that match their own hearers' desires. 
You got the picture? Yeah. That there were repeated warnings about deception. Why? Because we can be deceived. Deception is a constant possibility. And so the Bible calls us to discernment. And Paul says to the Thessalonians, don't be deceived. Not everybody who pretends to speak the truth actually does so. Test everything by the scriptures, the written word of God, which is our unique and final court of appeal. Check out the topic from all the relevant scriptures. Dig it out for yourself. No personal impressions, no personal so-called revelations or prophetic words or experience will ever negate what God has said in Scripture. Because God never contradicts himself and what he has to say, he has said in this book. And for the moment, he's not going to say any more to us than what he has said in this book. There will come a day when there will be two prophets standing in Jerusalem and who will admonish the Jewish people, and they're called prophets, which means that they're more than just preachers, but they're giving revelation from God. We haven't gotten there yet. For the moment, the canon of Scripture is closed. And until we get to that time right before the coming of Christ, we shouldn't expect that God's going to give us new information by other means of revelation. Now look at the rest of verse 3 and on through verse 5. Don't panic when you see things are going south. Do not let fear overcome your faith because the day of the Lord has not yet begun. The wrath of God is not yet being poured out in the world. I don't know if you believe that's true of the day in which we live because uh, the, the bolts are coming off right now in many parts of the world. It would be very interesting to see what the French decide on the parliamentary elections this afternoon. How many more elections are there going to be this year? Uh, by the time we get to the 31st of December, this world could be a rather different looking place. But unless the Lord Jesus returns for his church, the day of the Lord will not have begun. It will still be a time of grace. If I were to put a little title over verses 3 to 5, it might be this. We wait knowing that the day of the Lord is not for the church. That is the burden of Paul's argument in this paragraph. You wait for the Lord to return knowing that the day of the Lord is not for you. God has not appointed the church to experience the wrath of God, the outpouring of the wrath of God, which is going to test man's heart and his rebellion and to reveal it for what it is. It's not necessary for the church. And this truth should calm the fears and stir the faith of the Thessalonians. And Paul underlines this in, I think, no uncertain terms by helping us to see what will mark out the day of the Lord and how people will be able to recognize that they're in it. The Christians in Thessalonica had heard, we're in the day of the Lord. It's already started. Paul writes to them in 2 Thessalonians and say, can panic in Luxembourg. Don't, don't, don't. Um, Hold your horses. Um, there are two things that you need to remember will launch the day of the Lord and will have happened before you'll know that the, you're in the day of the Lord time frame. To put that differently, you will know that you're in the day of the Lord when these two things have occurred. Number one, Middle of verse 3. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Notice the adverb first, which means first. That is in order of chronological sequence. The first event is what he calls a falling away. We're going to talk about that little phrase quite a bit here in the next few minutes. 
and that man of sin be revealed. Those are the two things that must have occurred before one can say we're in the day of the Lord. Now, I'm going to take the liberty of correcting the KJV on this translation, a falling away in the course of our discussion. And I'm going to try to defend the better reading, the departure. So the first event is the departure, and the second event will be the revelation of history's greatest personification of evil, what many call the Antichrist or the beast. The, the one who makes a contract with many in Israel and will launch that seven-year period before the return of Christ in glory to set up his kingdom. When those two people, when those two pieces are fall into place, the departure and the, the revelation of this man of sin, then you can say that the day of the Lord is present. So if the Thessalonians were having difficulties, it wasn't because God was pouring out his wrath. It wasn't because the day of the Lord had come, it's just this was a fulfillment of what Jesus had predicted, that in this life you're going to have troubles. If you become a Christian, you don't say bye-bye to all of your difficulties. In fact, you say hello, hello to all kinds of new problems. Because if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is not going to be simpler. It's not going to be free of suffering. It's going to be a life of problems and challenges, and God's going to give you along with those difficulties all the help you need to face them and to keep your head above water. That's what the purpose of their difficulties was. It wasn't the judgment of God. Now, let's look a little more clear, uh, carefully at verse 3 in particular, because there are some um, textual problems here, and there are some translation issues that I'd just like to mention. If you're reading the uh, King James Version, you will see a reference to a falling away, and in verse Two, as we've already said, you'll see a reference to the day of Christ. And you will see, if you have a marginal rendering in your King James Bible, that it will say, or of the Lord. And this is a textual problem, uh, which was the original, and there are good reasons to believe that the day of the Lord is the original and not the day of Christ. The day of Christ refers, in Paul's letters, to the time uh, when the church is examined at the Bema seat. But the day of the Lord is a reference to the day of the Lord referred to over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament to refer to the time of God's or outpouring of judgment before the return of Christ. The, uh, the falling away that's mentioned here is also an interesting uh, phrase, and I'll take a little bit of time in just a few minutes to talk about why we would render that term departure rather than falling away. Um, if you read devotional books or commentaries, you will find that um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 is often used as a proof text to show that before Christ returns, uh, there's going to be a time of great doctrinal apostasy. And it could be that Paul is speaking about this departure as a decisive rejection of the truth, a radical apostasy of human religion in the last days. Because, let's face it, um, there has frequently been that kind of apostasy. And Jesus indicates in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke 21 that there will be a human religion that will reject Christ and will reject God, and that there will be such division in the world about truth and error that you'll even have kids uh, selling their parents over to the cops, and families will be divided among themselves, and there will be betrayal between close family members. In the original text, 
what is rendered by the key JV, A falling away, is actually the falling away or the departure. There's a definite article there, not an indefinite article. In the language of Paul in the first century, um, an indefinite article would be the absence of the definite article. We, we don't speak that way. We use an indefinite article, a, or some, in plural. And if we want to be definite, we talk about the, or them. But in the language of the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the New Testament, an indefinite article would just have no definite article. So the word that's used here, apostasia, is not an indefinite term, as if this were a trend. Paul is not saying um, that they shall not come except there come a departure, kind of a, a, an abandonment of truth in, in the general sense of a, a massive trend. But he uses the definite article, he apostasia, the apostasy. And those who would defend the notion that the apostasy is a departure from truth would say that there will come a time when uh, there will be a creation of a some kind of a massive world religion. And the book of Revelation speaks about that. Maybe it will be a combination of false Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and Buddhism, and Hinduism, and kind of an amalgam. Everybody's right, nobody's wrong. This is speculative. We don't really know exactly what the mixture is going to be, but at the middle of the tribulation period, in the middle of that opening part of the day of the Lord, one person is going to enter the temple in Jerusalem, which is not there right now, but this chapter talks about it. He's going to enter into the temple and declare that he is God and demand that everybody in the whole world will worship him. That is kind of a, an ultimate apostasy. But the book of Revelation will show that that happens in the middle. And Jesus says in Matthew 24 also that when Jews see the abomination that makes desolate appear in the temple of God, then hit the road and don't even go back and get your, your coat and tie. Just go to the desert to get out of the way because there's going to become great judgment in Jerusalem. And Daniel chapter 9 indicates that that will happen halfway into this period of seven years uh, after which, or at the beginning of which, this man makes a covenant with many people in Israel, perhaps to ensure their safety. Okay, all of that put together would lead us to conclude that if the worship of the beast is the apostasy, and that only happens in the middle of the seven-year period, then you wouldn't be able to say you're in the day of the Lord until the middle. But the day of the Lord begins at the beginning of the seven-year period and not in the middle. So, hay problemas. We, there's some questions here that we need to ask and answer. And maybe there is another option. Because the word apostasia can refer not necessarily to a doctrinal apostasy, but simply to a departure without further details given, except in the context. And this is what I would like to try to defend in the remaining time, that the departure, although it could be a time of mega departure from truth, from the word, at the beginning of the day of the Lord, may also be a departure from the world. So that the Apostle Paul is speaking here about the rapture of the church. The church's departure to heaven to be with Christ. I've been looking at this quite a bit in the last few weeks. And at this stage in my study, I must conclude that this is a preferable um, understanding of the passage to the, the first one I've just mentioned to you. And let me explain to you why and you think about it, and if you want to talk about it a little bit more afterwards, we can do that. The departing would have to come first. The lawless one would have to be disclosed. 
And according to verses 5 and 7, the restrainer will have to be removed, and then you can say you're in the day of the Lord. The departing must come first, followed by the revelation of the man of sin, whose nature and activity is described in detail in the rest of the chapter. What I'd like us to think about this afternoon is the nature, then, of this departure. And what I'm going to defend is not just some idea that Pastor Sam and I cooked up um, in, um, in the kitchen. In fact, we haven't really talked about it uh, much at all. So maybe this will um, raise your temperature, too. I don't know. But it, it has been defended by many serious Bible scholars. Kenneth Wiest, who used to teach at... Um, in Chicago, E. Schuller English, who helped to produce one of the um, later versions of King James, Dwight Pentecost, Wayne House, Thomas Ice, Henry Morris, Jimmy DeYoung, Arnold Fultenbaum, if you've read any of his material, Paul Lee Tan, the kind of a well-known book on the interpretation of Bible prophecy, Andrew Woods, J. Carl Laney, to name a few. They have worked a lot on this, and so I'm drawing from their insights. So here are some reasons why I think it's likely better to understand the departing to refer to the catching away of the church than to a time of radical apostasy at the beginning of the tribulation, which will indeed occur. The question is, what does Paul have in mind in this passage? Now, here's the sub-point. Apostasy has always marked the history of the Jews and of the church. Apostasy is nothing new. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Are you familiar with that chapter? Satan comes in, the master deceiver. Oh, really, has God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, Adam, Eve, let me clue you in on this one. He's just jealous. He's just telling that if you live forever, you will be as God's, and you'll know the, the difference between good and evil, and you'll be just like him, and you'll take him over. Talk about a projection of his own desire. He's the deceiver. And so you have the beginning apostasy, the departure from truth and from the authority of Scripture in Genesis 3 with the consequences that follow immediately. Think about the history of Israel. It's departure after departure after departure after after departure. So apostasy is nothing new and it is also something that occurs in the first century church. In fact, as you move toward the end of the development of Paul's letters, you find him warning more and more about this danger. So if in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, you will not know that you're in the day of the Lord until the apostasy, that is, defection from the word, occurs, how can that be a special event, a recognizable point in time, given that apostasy is generally a gradual motion away from truth? You know, most people do not commit apostasy from one day to the next. It might be that uh, a man is a pastor in a leading church and has defended in public a certain point of view and might have been uh, very orthodox. And then one Monday morning he comes out and he publishes some book that is way, way off base. And it looks like from one day to the, to the other he's changed his mind. But how long did it take him to prepare his book? He's been thinking about this question for several years. His, his departure from truth is a process. That's the way it is with churches. Many churches that are started by evangelists and missionaries that are faithful to scripture, have a solid foundation, and then the next generation comes that says, well, you know, what do those oldies know? We can improve on what the old people did because that's so out of fashion. Let's be up to date. And we can tweak a couple of things so that what we teach and what we do and how we go about it is better adapted to the society in which we live, and we'll get a lot more people coming in we can buy a new building and we will have a higher profile in the community and everybody will love us. 
And then third generation comes along, and um, in many cases, when you look at the history of Christianity, not just in Western Europe and the United States and Canada, but you look at it in Latin America and in Asia, there are, in the third and fourth generations, people who completely deny the gospel that their grandparents heard in the, that very same church. Apostasy is a process, not generally an event. That's one thing to remember. If apostasy tends to be a slow process, how will believers in the day of the Lord recognize it? Number two, as I've already mentioned, there's a definite article in front of this word translated in the KJV, falling away, the apostasia. So it is better rendered, rendered the <coughs> departing, the falling away, if you prefer, which suggests that it, it will be a specific event and not a trend. The departure, whatever it is, must be as definite and recognizable as the man of lawless himself, who also has a definite article put in front of his name, or his identification. That man of sin, hoandropos, that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. He is a distinct person. We're not talking about an influence, we're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church or any other false human religion personified in the man of sin. We're talking about an individual who's prophesied many times in the Old Testament and who is identified by the Lord Jesus himself in his teaching about future events and is also referred to by Paul in this passage and uh, John speaks about him that that spirit of Antichrist which is already now present is going to eventuate in a person who will be the perfect expression I don't know if you could say it's perfect but the ultimate expression of satanic deception if the man of sin has a definite article he's the man of sin and there's the departure, they are both very definite, and there's kind of a balance there. And that's important to realize when we look at this passage. Third point. The meaning of the word group allows for the sense of departing to refer to the rapture of the church. And they say, well, what is a word group? Is that a new band in town? Uh, no, a word group is a set of words that are related to each other. They're in a family. For example, in English, the words stance, stance is a noun, in case you were really scratching your head over that, and the word standing, which could be a noun, but it could also be a participle, a verbal form, and the verb stand, stance, standing, stand, are a word group. They are related forms of the same term. And what you can also do is hook prepositions on, for example, the, that word standing, to come up with slightly different meanings that are all derived from where a person stands. For example, you've got the word outstanding. Something is outstanding. It isn't actually standing anywhere, but it's a metaphorical word. That means it's, it's outside the, the average, the normal. It is outstanding. Or you have understanding, where ah, you, 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 you're, you're, you're underneath the, you're standing underneath the idea. You, you, you support it, you, you get it. Or you've got upstanding. A person who is upstanding is elevated in the group and is maybe a leader or has qualities of integrity. He's an upstanding citizen. All those words are part of a word group, we would say. Now, the New Testament language uses the same system. And you can take a verb and you can add a preposition to make a new verb. And you can have other nouns that are associated with that verb and preposition. I'm sorry for being so grammatical here. If you don't like grammar, um, you, you need to get a taste for this. Because this is one of the queen, the queens of the sciences, right? You um, grammar guys there working in Chinese, you know the importance of understanding how languages work. Chinese works completely differently. I don't know anything about that, but we can discuss it afterwards. 
In New Testament Greek, this is the way uh, the language works. And it's really kind of neat. So you take the verb stand, which is the verb istemi, and you can hook on a little preposition on the front of it and talk about apo, apos, apos, apistemi, to stand away from. From, apo means from. Stand from, stand away from, apistemi. And you've got a verbal form that is found in the New Testament. There is a, uh, there are at least two noun word, uh, words that are in the word group. Apistemi is the verb. Apostasia is the noun form, which means to stand away from, or the, the state of standing away from, or departure. And you've got the word divorce, apostel, which means if you give a certificate of an apostelion, you give a certificate that allows your ex to leave. This particular word that's used here in 2 Thess uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, is only used twice in the New Testament. Translated falling away or apostasy or departure. And one of the reasons why many modern versions translate the word apostasia by theological apostasy is because when you go to the book of Acts in chapter 21, you will find that the Jews accuse the apostle Paul of committing apostasy. <clears throat> they say, you have departed from the law of Moses. The other time the word apostasy is used in the New Testament is right here. So you've got two cases. In one passage, it's very clear that it's doctrinal apostasy. In the other case, the passage we're looking at, we're trying to say, well, what actually does it mean? It could mean doctrinal apostasy, but not necessarily so. Because when you look at word groups in the New Testament, and this is just an important thing, if you really want to do some careful study in the Bible, you need to understand how to do word studies. Because if you just look at one word and track all of the passages where that one word is used and come up with conclusions, you may come up with wrong conclusions because you need to study the word group and also look at synonyms. You need not only to look at the word apostasia, the noun, but look at the verb related to it, aphistemi, which means to depart. So you can look at departure, twice, or to depart in all of its verbal forms. He departed, she departed, he will depart, etc. And you find out when you look at the verb form, apistemi, that that particular word occurs 15 times, which, well, we can do a little more thorough, thorough study on words that occur more than uh, just twice. And this is what you discover. Out of those 15 times, there are three occasions where aphistemi, to depart, has to do with departure from the Word of God. And if you want to just jot them down, we'll not take time to read over these now because of the time limitations, but you can check it out on your own. Luke chapter 8, verse 13, which talks about a time of testing when some will fall away, they will depart. Luke 8, 13. Also, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, which we're looking at in the Spanish Bible study on Wednesday nights. 1 Timothy 4, 1. In the latter times, some will depart from the faith. That's the same verbal form that's used here related to the noun apostasia. They will afistomi, if we can use the infinitive form, in the middle voice. They, they will themselves depart from the faith. And then the last passage is in uh, Hebrews 3.12, which talks about falling away from the living God. Those are the three passages of the 15 that refer to falling away from the word, departing from the word. But the rest of the occasions where the verb used in the New Testament uh, re refers to situations in life, it applies to Departing from one place and going somewhere else. So in that sense, apostasia, apostasy, can mean simply, I departed. I physically moved somewhere else. I'll give you a list. Luke 2.37. 
Anna the prophetess did not, did not depart from the temple. Or Luke 4.13, the devil departed from Jesus after the temptations. Or Luke 13.27, Jesus will say, depart from me, all you who work iniquity. Acts chapter 5, verses 37 to 38, Gamaliel counseled the Sanhedrin, saying, stay away from these men. De literally depart from them, refrain from them, stay away, keep your distance. Acts chapter 12, verse 10, the angel who went into the prison to deliver Peter departed from him after the apostles' release. Acts 15, 38, Paul did not want to take along Mark who had departed, deserted them earlier. Acts 19.9, Paul withdrew from the Jews in Ephesus. He departed from the synagogue and went into the, uh, the house of Tyrannus to start a Bible institute. Acts 22.29, Paul's interrogators departed from him when they knew that he was a Roman citizen. They were beating him up, and then he says, I'm a citizen of, of Rome. Oh, that's apostasy. That is physical departure. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, Paul asked the Lord that his thorn in the flesh might depart from him. And then lastly, 2 Timothy 2, 19, Paul says, depart from iniquity. So what, what, what is this all about? Why am I going into this horrible amount of detail? And I thought maybe it would be a good thing to put this onto the screen, and I'll, I'll, maybe that will even further um, confuse you. When we talk about word studies in the New Testament, we need to look not just at a word that appears only twice in the Bible and draw conclusions about the meaning of one of those occurrences when the only other example we have shows that it is used in a very specific sense. But that doesn't tell us that in 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, 2, 3, that it means the same thing that, as it does in Acts 21. Not necessarily. So we, re we go to the related verb and we look at how the verb, the notion of departure, is... Uh, is translated. And you can also go to what are called lexicons. These are dictionaries that show examples of how words are used. The equivalent of this in English is the Oxford uh, Underbridge Dictionary, which is a massive multi... And anybody here have the Oxford Underbridge Dictionary? Uh, you remember when that appeared? Uh, I, I was doing my studies, uh, I think, in university when the Oxford Underbridge Dictionary came out and... Uh, my dad said, uh, I think it must be six or seven volumes, the unabridged. And my dad equipped, uh, why don't you print out a version for me uh, and get it on the way. I mean, this is a massive book that gives you not only the definitions of words, but tells you when in English literature did this, did this word first appear and what did it mean in that context. Absolutely fascinating read, if you like, words. And there are books like that that you can by as well that deal with ancient Greek and Koine Greek, the Greek of the New Testament, and the Greek of the Church Fathers. So you've got a whole span of language. And what is interesting is that if you look at the lexicon that talks about the Greek of the time before the New Testament, you will discover that apostasia and aphistemi can mean either departure from a teaching, that is, that is what we generally think of when we talk about apostasy, or it can mean departure from a place. So both of the meanings are possible in any of these contexts. The context will tell you what the meaning is. In lexicons about the Greek used after the time of the apostles, you find that the same thing is true. Apostasia and apistemi can mean either apostasy from the faith, or it can mean departing from one place and going to another. The context will tell you what we're talking about is a departure from the word or a departure from a location. Now I've got three other things and then we're finished. The context allows for the departing to refer to the rapture of the church because in verse 1, that's what he's talking about. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. 
That is, we will be gathered to him. There will be a change of location. This is not speaking about death, the death of the individual. This is speaking about the gathering of the church to Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 17 and following. And not only is the immediate context of 2 Thessalonians 2 favoring the notion of departure of the church from Christ uh, at Christ's return for her, but the larger context in these two letters favors the notion of the departure of the church at Christ's return for her. Because, as I said earlier, in 1 Thessalonians chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, you have a constant repetition of the theme that Christ is coming back for the church. On the other hand, there isn't anything in the discussion here at all that really deals with apostasy as we generally use the word. If Paul is talking about a departure from the faith, <coughs> why doesn't he discuss that further? That's an important point because he says the first thing that's going to happen is the departure. What do you mean, Paul? If there's no further explanation, then we must assume that the context will fill in the gaps in our understanding. Now, one other little thing that's quite intriguing is to look at how other English Bibles translated this term, apostasia, what KJV has, a falling away. One of the first translators of the Bible was a chap by the name of Jerome. And he did not translate into English. He translated from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. And the version that he created at the behest of the leaders of the early Roman church was called the Vulgate. That is, it was available to the common people or in common Latin. Most people didn't read Greek and Hebrew. And so this was made a little bit more accessible to Latin speaking people in the time of the late Roman Empire. And he translated this word, this term, by a Latin word that means departure. So if you read Latin, go back to Jerome's Vulgate and check out 2 Thessalonians 2 3, and you will see this term that he uses. Following on Jerome's translation into Latin, the early English translators of the Bible, including John Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, Kramer, Breaches, Beza, and the Geneva Bible, from around 1384 <laughs> to 1608, a few years before the KJV came out, all of those versions opted for the, re the rendering, the departing. The departing first. And then there came a marked change in the translations in English. This occurred in 1578 with the creation of the Reims Bible. We could say in English, Reims. The, the correct pronunciation would be Reims, which didn't have anything to do, I don't think, with Reims in France. But it's the Reims Bible of 1578. And the Reims Bible, which was a Roman Catholic English translation, wanted to get against to take a position against the Protestants. And so they translated this term, apostasia, by the word revolt. Go to the Reims Bible, you can check it out, I did this week, and you will find that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the term revolt is used to translate apostasia. So the Protestants are the rebels and they're spoken about in this passage, the Roman Catholic Church said in 1578. What do you think the Protestants did? They made their own translation. One of the most well-known in English ended up being the King James Bible. And because by that time, Henry VIII was all already history in the 16th century, we're in the beginning of the 17th century, the Anglican Church has started up 
um, Henry VIII wanted to have his own church, didn't like the fact that the Pope had said you can't marry that lady. And so the Anglican Church is uh, moving along, and there are many different English versions being translated. And uh, King James decides that there is a need for a, a, an authorized version that has the support of the English state church. And so he commissions the translation of the King James Bible. And the King James Bible uh, reflects a certain anti-Catholic bias. And so the King James writers decided that they were not going to allow this term to be rendered departing or rebellion. And so they wrote falling away. But in the early versions, all the English versions, there's never any hint of falling away. Falling away from what? What does that have to do with the passage? And so the King James Bible said, actually, it's the Catholics who were the apostates. The rendering of this passage became a question of polemics against the Protestants, or the Protestants against the Catholics, and vice versa. Because there was an interpretation of future events that viewed the Pope as the Antichrist, and the Protestants said, you know, that this, this, the Pope was the really bad guy. He's the man of sin. And the Catholics responded by saying, no, you guys are the bad guys. And that kind of dispute affected the translation of the service. Wow. So what you do is you go back to the Greek lexicons and say, well, what does this word really mean? And you discover, to your surprise, that the word apostasia means simply departure. The departure must come first. Well, what's the departure, Paul? Uh, please, please help us understand. Well, I've already talked about it in verse 1. The departure is our gathering together to him. We will leave this world. That's going to happen first. And then the man of sin will be revealed. And when the man of sin is revealed, you're in the day of the Lord, my friend. But if that's the correct interpretation, then that tells us something very important about the timing of the coming of Christ for the church. That it will come before the day of the Lord starts because the purpose of the day of the Lord is to pour out the wrath of God upon people who hate his guts. And when they see the wrath of God poured out, they're not at all about to repent. They're going to raise their fists in defiance. They're going to hide in the caves. They're going to build their own world governments, their own world economy, and do their very best under satanic power to push against the authority of the land. And God will laugh in heaven. And finally, Christ will come back and set things right. One last point. Paul's warnings about doctrinal apostasy tend to cluster later in his ministry. So, I think this is a minor point, but it's an intriguing one. First and Second Thessalonians are, are two early letters. The preoccupation with apostasy in Paul's letters tends to cluster toward the end of his life. It's in Acts 20, toward the end of those missionary journeys, that he begins to warn the, the elders at Thessalonica, watch out, you guys are going to be traitors to your own cause. And some of you guys sitting here, right around our circle, are going to end up saying, I, I'm power hungry, and I'm going to try to draw off followers of me be, because I can invent a new, a new slant on the gospel. There's going to be apostasy. And you see the emphasis of that um, intensify as you move toward the end of Paul's ministry. At the beginning, it doesn't seem to be <coughs> as much in the spotlight. Now, I'm not prepared to make this understanding of this term, apostosia, a major doctrinal controversy. I'm not going to plant my flag here and say, if you don't agree with me, you'll kill me, something like that. I'm not sure I'd be ready to go to prison over this. But I, I think it's a distinct possibility, and I find the argument for it to be quite convincing. Now I do think about it. Whether the departure, the departure, is a mass departure, a radical repudiation of faith in the day of the Lord, or if it is a departure of the church to heaven. Those are the two choices. I don't know of any other. But if the second option is true, then although there are many examples of apostasy in our own day, 
the great departure of the church from this world has not yet occurred. Therefore, we're not in the day of the Lord. We're still here, which means there's work to do. And that is supposed to be comforting. Now, I think that there are many people who are either quite nervous about the things they see on the news, or they're in complete denial and want not even to listen to it. Turn off, you know, I, I can't handle it. I don't want to listen to it. Uh, I suppose there are some who rejoice over the, the general chaos in the world. I don't think any of you do. But God's Word wants us to be aware of what's going on. We need to be informed. These are talking points with your neighbors. But we must not panic. Don't be shaken in mind or be troubled either by spirit or by word or by supposed teaching from the Apostle Paul to the effect that we're already in the tribulation. No. First there has to come the departure when we go to be with the Lord. We're awaiting that time. And meanwhile, we have work to do. And we have all the tools available made available to us by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God to be faithful to Him until He comes. A word for you to think about this week and to meditate on and take home. No panic. Did I say it that way in Luxembourgish a moment ago? You, know, you need to learn some Luxembourgish. Can panic. Can you say that? Can panic. No panic. Um, I'm not saying, don't worry, be happy. That song uh, was not written by a Bible Christian. Don't worry, be confident. Amen. God's getting his work done. He's getting his plan accomplished. And if we are in step with him, he can use us to do that work this week. Father, we thank you for your word. Many things here that uh, stretch our minds I trust challenge our hearts. Help us to be faithful to you in these coming days. Help us to take advantage of the uh, opportunities that you make for us and help us to be looking for those opportunities to make a difference around us. Thank you for the hope that we have, the blessed hope that Paul talks about in Titus, the, the blessed hope of the appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You look forward to his coming. It will be great if it were this week, but if it isn't, uh, grant us the joy of living fellowship with you and being used by you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.